Well, hello, everyone. We're going to start with the introduction of ourselves. So, yeah, this is Jacqueline Byun. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of the art consulting agency called K Artist. We are based in Seoul and provide the art advisory services and educational seminars for the individuals and corporates in cooperation with the international art dealers. Uh, so I will uh, introduce you know, Professor Yang first. He's the director of the Iuha Women's University and specializes in uh, MBA courses on art business. And Andy St. Louis, he's the founder of the Seoul Art Friend, uh, and he, his online platform covers you know, mostly about the Korean art scene and dedicate to promote the Korean contemporaries. Um, he's an art critic and the curator with the seven year experience um, in the Korean art market. And uh, he currently resides in Seoul as an editor of the Art Asia Pacific magazine and contributing editor of the Art Review Asia. And lastly, Brian Ba, he is the editor of the Gallery Park, whose uh, gallery is located in Hannam area, which is quite trendy art scene in Korea right now. And he is a second generation owner of the gallery. Uh, and the gallery represents the Korean masters like the Kim Chang Yeol and Nam Jun Pak. And nowadays, he even covers the Korean and other international contemporary artists as a young collector. So let me give you more about um, background information about what we are going to talk today. It's about the Korean current Korean art scene and some of the agendas will be covered why the arts are so hot nowadays. So Korea has recently emerged as an attractive art market uh, that is due to the purchasing power of the younger gen collectors and it is grabbing increasing interest from the uh, globally, uh, global art world. So despite the pandemic, uh, the global art market did not struggle at all. And uh, people stayed at home and they enjoyed purchasing art and they spent money on interiors uh, other than travel. And even online auctions, mm -hmm. you know, and the, pairs, the online viewing room, uh, they make people to purchase art more easily. So currently, the pandemic helped people to bring up their own life more than any other time. And people started to enjoy culture and newly discovered how to experience the galleries. So many people are starting uh, collecting art within their budget nowadays. And globally renowned galleries are also opening their branches in South Korea. Uh, also, Freeze, one of the largest contemporary art fair, are having their first show in, in Seoul next week with the collaboration with the Korean uh, Art Association. So what does it mean people started to collect art in this pandemic? Global art market is experiencing record-breaking sales and Kiev, which is the largest art fair with a long history of 20 years. They are, gained, they are just gained a huge success in the number of their visitors and sales volume this year especially. So let's look into more over what's going on in the market uh, with other three art professionals here. Uh, so let me move over to Brian, Mr. Park, director of the Kelly Back First. Brian, can you talk about more about uh, Korean art scene as a second generation gallery owner? Uh, so first, of, we just finished Kiev last week, uh, two weeks ago, and, they, and I'll just uh, brief the how the Kiev went. In terms of Kiev, I felt they put a really lot of efforts to. Uh, for the overall the enhancement of the quality of the gallery representations and the promotion of the fair itself. And I think I can say that Kiev 2021 was perhaps one of the most successful edition for the last decades. And our gallery strategy was to show uh, how broad our spectrum is. Like we represented the talents from uh, globally renowned artists, the blue chip artists to an up and coming emerging artists. And in order to effectively show the change in our gallery, we showed uh, young media artists and NFT artists artworks as well. And we also executed uh, an on air an art, art, the artist live painting performance at our booth during the art fair. And such events and these uh, coordination really uh, got the visitors involved in the art fair and the collectors to be really actually engaged with the art fair itself. And I could see that the notable change, which was the demographics of the collectors. Uh, the younger generations come to galleries and auction houses and on art fairs more often than ever. And the fun fact is they put a lot of time for actually studying what they're buying. Uh, when they 
think they know what they are buying and they just do not hesitate to actually buy and confirm their purchase on the artworks. And traditionally, I can say the collectors tend to think over time and to, uh, to get decided what they are really buying or not. But these, the younger generation collectors, they just study what they are buying and they just go for it. And I, I think that, that those are the notable change that we could see on the art market trend. And the, I could also say the purpose of the, the collecting is the purely, not the purely, but mostly the investment purpose. They're not just like art collecting, but they're kind of buying art is like what the people are interested in nowadays. And that's kind of what I'm worried about a little. And for the, you want me to go over the other market issues? At the, at the well, actually, or? later I can hear more more from Mr. Yang, uh, Professor Yang, about how he could enjoy the key up and what was the difference he could feel as an art enthusiast first, and then we'll move over more to talk about the collectors and its change. Can we? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Professor well, Yang, can uh, we hear? Yes, I, I, I can hear. I can hear you very well. Mm -hmm. Right. I, yeah, I mean, as uh, Mr. Pack mentioned, the uh, Kiev had uh, you know great, great success a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but what I need to mention at the moment is even though there were more than uh, 88,000 people visiting this uh, event, and uh, this event earned more than, uh, you know, 60 uh, about uh, how much was the volume? Is it one of uh, sixty, almost the uh, sixty billion dollars? But uh, what I should mention here is still, even though this is one of the biggest the performance in the last 20, 20 years in the art market, but uh, their sales volume is very, very trivial, very small compared to the other international uh, the art mm -hmm. fairs, such as uh, you know the, uh, the uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, the art fair. So I note that uh, our current art market is uh, improving and getting bigger, but uh, we need to put more effort in treating the VVIP and VIP uh, clients uh, because the major purchase, you know, come from uh, these, you know, affluent uh, the people's domains. So, uh, uh, but uh, we are cruising on, and uh, I'm pretty sure that the next year the KF will uh, come up with the totally uh, different and far more improved the uh, attitudes and the exhibitions for this event. So let me uh, maintain very positive expectation for the next year for the Kia. Yes, we fully agree with Mr. Yang. And uh, Andy, can we talk a little bit about your you know, experience in Korean market and you know your, uh, how did you feel about the new atmosphere Kia? Sure. Uh, so, you know, Kia, for anyone who's not familiar, is the Korea International Art Fair. Uh, and this year was its 20th anniversary. Um, it began in 2002. And it was held at COEX uh, in the Gangnam area of Seoul. Uh, it's the largest art fair in Korea. And this year, around 170 galleries uh, were participating. And it's important to note that this fair is operated by the Galleries Association of Korea, which is the sort of governing body for the domestic art galleries. Um, I think the fair was, as Professor Yang said, uh, a disputed uh, success, uh, a huge number, uh, attendance numbers, especially after last year uh, when organizers were forced to abandon the event due to uh, concerns over the pandemic. Um, one thing that really struck me this year as different from previous years was the introduction of a VVIP day. Uh, typically, art fairs, whether they're in Korea or abroad, will include at least one day for VIP uh, visitors, which usually includes uh, major art collectors, museum professionals, and other sort of industry insiders. Uh, and this year, Kiaf sort of took that one step further by creating this VVIP day, uh, which was on the Wednesday uh, before 
VIP day on Thursday and then public days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And what was sort of strange about this VVIP day was uh, that they were selling tickets for the VVIP day, which sort of defeats the purpose of uh, what people may have thought would be sort of privileged access uh, to the fair. Um, there were more than 5,000 people in attendance on the VVIP day, uh, which again seemed uh, to be different from a lot of these other major fairs where the, VI, uh, the VIP uh, visiting hours are usually less crowded, less stressful, and it's usually when most of the art purchases take place. Um, however, I could see sort of the reason why Kiev opted to uh, try to distinguish uh, more levels of VIP access as they're looking towards next year when uh, Freeze Art Fair, which is a major international art fair, uh, is set to make its uh, debut also here in Seoul. Yes, I agree to you, Andy, because yeah, for, I mean, yeah, Kiaf has sold the VVIP ticket for uh, one or two days, and I, as I know, they have shut down it quite fast. I think there might be the concerns about the same opinion with you. And, but the globally, the art fairs, you know, the VVIP day, the VIP day is the most, you know, there are so many crowds always, you know, even in Switzerland, Basel, I participated after this pandemic this summer. Oh, actually that was fall, yeah. But still, the, on the VIP day, there's so long line, and you know, I think it it should be the problem for overall art fair globally. Yeah, I mean, one thing also this year at Kiev uh, was the presence of Western galleries was much stronger this year than mm -hmm. in years past. Uh, Kiev has always invited uh, some of the major Western galleries, particularly those that operate spaces here in Seoul. Uh, including Pace Gallery and Perotan mm -hmm. Gallery. Um, we saw all the galleries that, that do have outposts in Seoul um, had major presence at Kiev, except for um, Tadeus Ropak, which just opened uh, last month here. Um, but also added to this list of international galleries that have a presence in Seoul were other galleries uh, that do not have a presence in Seoul, particularly uh, two galleries from Berlin. Uh, one is Esther Schipper, the other is Perez Projects, and also Spruth Magers, uh, which has branches in Berlin and London and Los Angeles. And I thought overall, uh, these booths particularly had very high quality, very high value uh, works for sale, although they were very focused on non-Korean artists. Uh, one exception would be Pace Gallery, which uh, did show some great works of Korean modern paintings. Uh, but Paratang Gallery, which uh, is based in Paris, but has branches all over the world, uh, Paratang filled its entire booth with a solo presentation of paintings and sculptures by Takashi Murakami, who is arguably one of the most uh, recognizable uh, contemporary artists uh, in the international uh, arena. and. Um, from what I hear, sales were very strong uh, across the board for the international galleries. And uh, you know, for the first time ever, I felt that the presence of the Western galleries at Kiev uh, was really significant and actually felt meaningful. Uh, whereas in past years, I thought that uh, the few galleries that were participating from overseas were almost there as uh, sort of tokens or as sort of uh, just making an appearance rather than attempting to have a real impact on the Korean art scene. I agree. And the Pace Gallery booth, they even show the, you know, comparative art history, you know, because they have the Adul Purgat clip, which is like the three, uh, 30 million, uh, 3 million USD one, uh, along with the Hwang Gi Kim, is Korea's, you know, number one master in art history. So that kind of comparative, you know, approach can be helpful for Korean art market development, I guess. And for the Paratang, yeah, yes, they showed the solo books about the, you know, Murakami and the, those beginners in the art collection, they really enjoyed it in as of now. They used it as a photo spot for the Kiev and uploaded it on the socials and that might be really helpful for the visitor number, I guess. So Brian, can you add some more comments about the other booths in Kiev? Uh, 
the one that I can remember was to the other Korean galleries, like such as uh, Gallery Baton. They they are really good. So the booth design was the, they're the spectacular. They just even made a like a small window to see people can mm -hmm. actually enter the booth and see uh, around the space itself. And uh, not just them, because and all, we also do and all of the other galleries. They would. They could have put a lot of efforts to make the best booth designs to gather the crowds and to make the sales happen during this high peak season. Um, our strategy here was also to, uh, to give a sense that we are capable of like showing a, like a broad spectrum. And I could see the the uh, the glass tone was like the just. They, they just sent their stand was like right across ours and their booth uh, design was also phenomenal and they just had like a uh, little empty spaces with uh, people could see around and the paintings and sculptures around and the one that i could remember the most was uh, from the booth uh, by gallery Schiller. uh there they put a rep solo representation of robert berry and they just had a conceptual art that the uh, booth was closed for the entire fair. And it's like the idea of the conceptual art that people can't, there is an art fair and there is a booth of art exhibition, but it is closed and they cannot enter. And it is the way, the play of like how people can see and encounter the contemporary art to the fair visitors. Those are the booths that I could remember during the Kia. Thank you, Brian. That was really a good opinion. But we might have go to the for the you know public audiences. So maybe we can talk more about why the Korea market is on the boom, you know, in this international art scene, that kind. Uh, so Professor Yang, can you add more comments about this? You are the art yeah. enthusiast. You are not from the art world, so maybe you can share more opinions, you know, for the public audience. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, probably we could, you know, they pick up more than, you know, 20 or 25 variables that may help increase and boost up the Korean art market. The first reason I should mention is the uh, per capita GDP uh, effect, because currently the Korean per capita GDP exceeded uh, $30,000. So if the uh, per capita GDP exceeds at $30,000, then lots of uh, huge demands will explode, particularly for the art and culture and entertainment. So this is exactly what I think has happened for the past couple of years in Korea. I mean, uh, it's very surprising to uh, observe the, uh, the repetition of this uh, phenomenon in Korea, because uh, regardless of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic for the past couple of years. And another reason is, you know, the uh, Mr. Gunhee Lee, who used to be CEO of Samsung, has passed away this year. So E. Gunhee collection has earned a lot of attention from the uh, lots of people, including professionals and uh, amateurs uh, or the all, all the people and uh, still lots of uh, local governments are now the persuading the central government to uh, host this uh, museum for Egoni collection in their own cities so all this uh, public and private you know the efforts really helped to earn the uh, great attention from the public the third issue is still the MZ generations which are now aged between uh, mid-20s to uh, the early 40s I mean, these are the uh, successors of our foreign families and parents. And they have, I mean, we used to joke that the, here, this is the era of uh, a desired democracy. That means even though you may not have a rich house or car, but uh, your, your desire for experience, I mean, the, uh, the art experience or entertainment experience or culture experience, you know, is supposed to be the same as the other foreign people. So in other words, if there is great, uh, you know, the boom or boost about any uh, art event or any issues, lots of Koreans just, you know, dash to uh, experience, uh, develop, uh, experience the same experiences as uh, the other foreign people. So that this is one of very noticeable feature and characteristic of MZ generations. And, you know, in China, the uh, most of the luxury consumers uh, more than 50% of luxury consumers are MZ generations in China. And in the global market, uh, the MZ generations have recorded more than 52% of the uh, very, very uh, the expensive the art collections. 
and their average, you know, the uh, demand is over uh, $200,000. So, I mean, uh, the, all these phenomena, probably we could mention more than at this three, but I do believe that these three factors uh, in together have pushed the, uh, uh, you know, the current, uh, the boost of the art market in Korea. Thank you, Professor Yang. Yeah, I'm fully agree to your opinion. So in terms of culture, there's a craze about, you know, K-pop, Korean beauty, and movie like Parasite. So as you just mentioned, Bodo, you know, uh, Freeze Art Director also mentioned that beside a great art community in Korea, there's an incredible music, you know, food and architecture, and there must be reasons for the people to visit Seoul. And then beyond art, Korea currently does not impose any tariffs or the VAT on the artworks. So that makes, you know, Korea, you know, more particularly attractive to international galleries. So as a result, as Andy mentioned, blue chip art dealers are opening their spaces in Seoul for the last, you know, four to five years. And these developments, you know, might mean for the future of the domestic art market. So maybe we can talk more about what sort of benefits and risks we can anticipate. Uh, Brian, can we talk more about this, you know, risks and benefits we are having all the international galleries? Because you're in the center, because your galleries reside in the Hanam area, so. Uh, I see it as a very positive effect on the Korean art scene in general. It is, I think it is beneficial for all. The collectors and audience can see the international, internationally prominent artists, so their works in person in the Hanamdong area. When they and they're kind of collect, they're gathered in the in the uh, narrow district, so they can go to like like four to five galleries at one visit, and they and it's a really a uh, positive uh, like effect for it, uh, visit, uh, collectors and audience side. And for the galleries, and we are also get motivated and by the new market forces, and we are really eager to present a better representation of artists. We would like to show more uh, organized and curated shows to not like kind of uh, beneficially competing with these uh, uh, blue chip galleries. And I think the artists are also getting more if, more opportunities to go, to go abroad and show their works. Around the, to a bigger audience by by having the this blue chip representation. I'm not saying the artists can directly go to this blue chip, but they are there are more opportunities can be happening from these networkings, and they could uh, do a show that which has a partnership with these other galleries. And I think that instead of seeing these foreign galleries coming coming to Korea and they they're taking the collector piece, I don't think it like that way. And I see them as a catalyst to grow the entire, the market size of the art collectors. And by that, um, by saying that, I think the people are more interested in young Korean artists as well. Like by seeing these prominent artists from those blue chip artists from the, the, the foreign international galleries, and going to the local Korean galleries, they're expecting a better talents from the young and up and coming Korean artists as well. I see, so I see that as a positive result. Okay, thank you, Brian. Okay, in terms of this, you know, there has been notable changes in the past years, you know, for sure. So according to the art market, you know, 2021, which is published by the Art Basel, sponsored by the UBS, the more than half of the people spent on art uh, artwork purchase over one hundred million one million dollar were in their twenties and thirties, surprisingly. And fifty two percent of the people are born between nineteen eighty one and nineteen ninety six, and four percent were born after that even. And also the online transactions, you know, the volume is like twenty five percent already, and that is the three times increase from the previous year. So I think the general sales have been increasing and they were driven by the people aged between 20 and 40 in general. So, and even the affluent, you know, mid-age collectors, uh, and they uh, chose the art as a alternative investment and they choose to have more blue chip, you know, Korean masters. And it's due to the, you know, real estate regulation by the government. I would like to talk more about that. So, Andy, do you see 
because you know, there is a government <clears throat> regulation on the real estate market, you know, due to the hype. So can you add some more comments on that? With regard to the real estate market, uh, that's not exactly my area of uh, expertise, but what I can comment on are the sort of favorable economic conditions uh, here in South Korea that makes it a, an enticing place for uh, Western galleries to do business, especially over the past four to five years, as you mentioned. Um, I actually wrote a piece last month for Art Review Magazine about why the art world uh, has sort of fallen in love with Seoul. Uh, and this phenomenon has really uh, accelerated in the past, I would say, two to three years. Um, you know, for more than a decade, Hong Kong has really dominated the contemporary art scene in Asia. Um, the city hosts Art Basel Hong Kong, which is the biggest art fair in the region. And it's home to, you know, dozens of international galleries uh, from the United States and from Europe, particularly, that have sort of flocked there since the early 2000s. Uh, and one of the main reasons why Hong Kong has sort of uh, become the dominant uh, center for contemporary art uh, are the favorable economic conditions there, uh, which includes no import or export taxes on artwork, no sales tax, um, and no VAT. Uh, but, you know, over the past few years or so, at least since uh, 2019, uh, when the protests began in Hong Kong, uh, it's become a less uh, confidence in uh, doing business in Hong Kong has decreased uh, and has become a less appealing uh, business center than it once was. And so now, you know, eyes are really on South Korea because uh, this country offers virtually the same uh, financial benefits as Hong Kong uh, with no import tax, no VAT, and no transfer taxes, uh, except Korea doesn't have any of the sort of socio-political instability uh, that Hong Kong is experiencing right now. Uh, additional factors are that, you know, Korea already has a very strong domestic art market. It has a robust uh, arts infrastructure and it has a thriving contemporary art scene uh, filled with you know, uh, really incredible artists uh, from the emerging end of the spectrum all the way to the sort of established uh, masters. Um, and as a result, we've seen major Western galleries, like Paratan, which we talked about earlier, also Lehman Mopen, which is an American gallery, and Pace, which is a sort of mega gallery that operates like Paratan all over the world. Uh, they all opened spaces in Hong Kong uh, in the early 2010s, but within the peers, they have all expanded to Seoul. Uh, and business uh, seems to have been good. You know, uh, Pace upgraded their space uh, earlier this year to a much larger uh, and newer building. And Lehman Mopan is also set to do the same uh, this winter. But Beyond galleries that sort of began in Hong Kong and then have expanded to Seoul, there are other Western galleries that are looking to Seoul as the home of their regional flagships and sort of foregoing Hong Kong altogether. Uh, and that was certainly the case uh, this year. We had uh, Tadeus Ropak, uh, which just opened their first Asian space last month in Hanamdong near uh, Brian's space. Uh, Koenig Gallery opened a space in Chengdam in Gangnam District, and Gladstone Gallery, which is from New York, uh, they are also set to open their first Asian space in Gangnam next year. And these are all considered blue chip galleries, as we've been talking about, uh, which is a reference to sort of blue chip stocks, which are considered, you know, reliable long term investments. So these blue chip galleries are ones that are known for having artist rosters and for selling uh, artworks that uh, promise to increase in value over time, which you know allows collectors to build wealth uh, by purchasing artworks to hang uh, in their homes or in their offices. Um, and so you know due to these factors, the time is certainly ripe for Seoul to sort of level up its uh, art market, and continue to attract more Western art galleries 
and uh, expand uh, expand the offerings for both local collectors uh, and international collectors who are looking toward Korean artists to diversify their own collections. Thank you, Andy. Uh, okay, those you know blue chip, you know, you know galleries are quite spread in the market for sure. But you know, for the general public, I mean, normally, you know, people just you know what people think the you know artwork is a good alternative for replace the demand for the luxury goods kind. So more Koreans are consider those artwork as a way to decorate their homes. Uh, we used to hang, you know, wedding pictures or the family pictures in the living room, but now they want to decorate the home with a nice painting. That must be why all the international blue chip dealers are coming as well. And you know, for you know, in a public standard, you know, the purchases around like one thousand USD only of, until now. Unlike the luxury handbags, as you just mentioned, uh, the value decreased. Uh, the handbags, you know, decreased the value over time. But the artwork is something that people can enjoy for long term. So it's and its value can surge, you know, in the near future as well. So people feel spending on artwork is more meaningful than spending on luxury items, I guess. And unlike the older generation, you know, they are uh, they have been considering about the saving a lot. But the young people, those collect new collectors, they enjoy show of their what they have or what they own on the socials. So artwork can be something that they can easily, you know, photograph and share the, on their Instagram. So I think that must be the reason why Korean art scene is growing so rapidly for the last five to six years after the, you know, Korean monochrome rapid, uh, Korean monochrome movement, it's a rapid rise in the blue chip movement. I so let me add some more comments about the uh, real estate market as again issue as well. So real estate investors in South Korea, they were looking for all the alternatives to build their wealth because the government regulation is getting tough to, uh, and they wanted some regulation to cool the overheated housing market as well. So the government has raised taxes on multi homeowners and even they tightened, they, uh, tightened the regulations on real estate loans as well. And as we know, the from 2022 and 2023, the government will also start imposing capital gain taxes for the first time on cryptocurrency and the stock trading, respectively. Right? But however, still the art uh, works valued below 50,000 USD. They are the exemption from these, you know, capital gain taxes and pieces above, above that amount. 22% taxes on maximum, always 20% of the sales price. So transactions by living local artists are also the exemption as well. That must be one of the main factor to boost the market, I think. So ever since the current government you know, took over, people feel extremely difficult to find alternative investment way uh, as to build the wealth and from the property market. So I think that will be, go on for a while. Mm, okay. Let's move on to this, you know, freeze art fair again, uh, because, you know, I need to introduce, uh, give you some of the background information for the next year. So freeze art fair, they are the, okay, <clears throat> they are the major influence for the market forces that have, uh, they will be, they will be the major influences and market forces to guide the development of the Korean art market from next year. And we also should mention about the auction results. They have already, uh, I mean, this year, for the first six months, uh, the overall volume, sales volume has exceeded the one of the la whole uh, last year. So it's not just all the wealthier Koreans who are getting into the art for now. Um, and then with the coming of, you know, those international galleries, as Andy mentioned, uh, it will be the year for the younger generation collectors, I guess. So, you know, for I think we have been covering all those, you know, international galleries activities in Korea and then about why people are starting to invest in art. And now we want to move on to another trendy issue, which is really hot, the NFT market. And from the NFT market and the fractional owner offerings, uh, I would like to pass the mic to the Professor Yang, who has been has an interest in this market for long, and maybe you can explain. We can give share your you know basic information. What is the concept, and what is the vision for the future? Yeah, NFT stands for non fungible token. So uh, this is a very uh, different concept 
compared to uh, public and general uh, tokens such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. Even though we use Ethereum to uh, purchase digital art from a very famous uh, platform such as OpenSea and Nifty, uh, Nifty Gateway, etc. Because once you purchase Ethereum, I mean, your digital ID will be, uh, you know, the coin on that uh, token. And then you can use that your digital ID D, you know, coin in that uh, token to purchase digital art so that your digital art will be, you know, identified your own ideas. So that is your own. So uh, there are lots of positive aspects for this business model. First one, you can get freed from the controversy over the, uh, you know, authenticity and, uh, you know, the, uh, of, of, your, of your art. Because you know, unique ID will be, uh, you know, uh, assigned for your uh, the digital art. And secondly, I mentioned about the major features of MZ generations. And their parents are now over 65 and getting very get, getting close, or, or some, someone maybe over the 70 years old. So this is about right time for them to inherit the affluence from their parents. And as uh, the uh, Ms. Uh, Bian mentioned, the Korean government has, uh, you know, the, uh, revised our tax regulations in favor of art collections since 2018. So you can get a lot of, uh, you know, tax uh, incentives if you, uh, you know, consume your uh, inherited, uh, the, uh, you know, fortunes to purchase art compared to other, uh, the alternative investments such as real estate and the financial products such as uh, stocks and uh, just the, the virtual currencies. So these are the major reasons why the MZ generation who have been looking for brand new and breakthrough and innovative uh, you know, uh, ways to invest their affluences and also brand new, uh, the art and the cultures. So absolutely, the, you know, the Christie has uh, taken the initiative to uh, uh, put the digital art in auction uh, about uh, 2020. And uh, I do believe that this year, uh, Christie, particularly everyone knows about the famous auction in, in Christie in, in March this year, uh, the people who uh, recorded uh, you know, uh, over 700, uh, uh, how much is it? Uh, $700 million. I heard that uh, this is the third most expensive uh, record of the art sales, you know, uh, so far. So even though uh, there are some complaints about this brand new uh, mood of the art, I think that is the nature of the art, you know, all the time artists or art or even the art collectors have, uh, uh, look for, uh, long for, uh, brand new way, innovative, uh, you know, the uh, insights and perspectives in art. So for these reasons, an NFT has successfully earned the attention of the people. And while supporting my interpretation of uh, recent development NFT, the NFT has improved significantly for the past, you know, three or four years. For example, uh, in the 2019, the annual growth so almost more than five times. And in the year 2020, you know, their growth rate is almost the five or six times. And in, even in this year, in the first quarter, the NFT sales have exceeded, has exceeded the entire sales revenue of year uh, 2020. So I do uh, maintain very positive uh, prediction and forecasting for the growth of NFT uh, for a while. And I do believe that uh, the very famous artists, such as including uh, David Hockney, will join this effort, even though he uh, criticized his art very badly, uh, you know, some months ago. Thank you, Professor Yang. As you just mentioned, you know, the size of the NFT market, it is like 40 times bigger compared to the year of 2000, you know, 2018. And the ratio of the art is like the 5% still, but there are so many potential in it. And still, there are so many controversial issues. But as you just say, the David Hawken is joining and the Murakami Takas is joining. So we cannot ignore it anymore. And the, yeah, the like 7 million USD, it's as much, it's the, as expensive as the Van Gogh in a modern art compared to yeah. it. So, but uh, okay, let's share more uh, opinions from Brian, the director of the Gallery Park again. How do you think about this NFT market, the new trend? I think the NFT market will definitely, definitely expand to a bigger industry. However, I do not see it as the future of the fine art market. So as, as the NFT is a totally different market from the traditional art market. 
Uh, it is true that the artworks must be in good qualities to be successful and be tradable in the art market, but how the buyers in the NFT market see it is a whole new chapter in that industry. I think without understanding the essence of the crypto world and blockchain industry, I doubt that no traditional art galleries or institution or auction houses can preoccupy the NFT market. And these people do not buy NFT art because the art is in good qualities or they're made by the good artists. Uh, they're just looking, they're not looking for a fine art artist. They are looking for a crowd pleasing item that can be used as an investment for their uh, like cryptocurrency. And even with such difference, I'm personally intrigued by this NFT market. So I'm actually actively preparing for the, to get in the NFT scene to what I can contribute and what I can actively, actively take a presence in this market. But I kind of see it as I, and I really need to prepare to see it as a different point of view from the traditional gallery scene. Yeah, as you just mentioned, you know, the one of the top three galleries, you know, the pace, they're just starting to have their subsidies about this NFT market called Super Blue, and they're expanding, you know, quite fastly. And how was the response about your NFT show, you know, during the Kiev? Because I think you were taking the initiative in this market as well. How was people's so, response to that? So we showed an artist. Uh, his name is South Beck, and he had like a, his, a parody of the Elon Musk as this, their series. And I, I found it funny was because people can see the almost all, everyone who is involved in the cryptocurrency knows the name Elon Musk because how the, the presence of such figure is quite a, puts an impact on the crypto scene. And I think such issue is people can see, that can relate to, oh, there's a, a guy who does the, like he's the, the, the owner, the founder of Tesla, but he's kind of doing the one Bitcoin and the other kind of cryptocurrency scene. And the visitors at the fair find, found it really funny. Oh, that's, oh, is that the NFT and we can buy with the coin? So mm -hmm. they just asked me, can I buy this with the US dollar or Korean one, or do I have to pay you in Ethereum? And I said, uh, it's on the platform called the, the foundation and the artist puts in the Ethereum. And this is the way uh, we wanted to show we're not, we're kind of in the game to see what we can do. It was really interesting scene. Thank you. And Andy, you might not have much opinion about this you know, agenda, but maybe as an art professional anyway, can you give some comments on it? Sure. Um, so, you know, the NFT uh, market and NFT scene, which has really sort of uh, exploded uh, just during this past year, as Professor Yang said, uh, that sale of the Beeple work, I think, really opened people's eyes to uh, what was possible in terms of this market. Uh, it definitely appeals uh, to individuals involved in cryptocurrency. Uh, and sort of alternative modes of uh, trading uh, and developing their own investment portfolios. Uh, and so with that in mind, you know, I think <clears throat> NFT artworks, uh, they definitely attract a different type of collector. I, I think as Brian mentioned, um, you know, these NFT artworks are distinct from more traditional or conventional uh, fine artworks. Uh, they are they only exist digitally um, and though there are some interesting uh, sort of ins and outs of uh, ownership um, and, and other uh, sort of details uh, in terms of the transaction you know it's unclear whether nfts are really a sustainable format for fine art in the long term um, you know they're principally investment focused uh, rather than sort of artistically focused. And I think as we look at the, the collectors who are uh, pursuing these NFT artworks, uh, we will find that um, there is less sort of connoisseurship or less sort of expertise about the art world than we might find in traditional collectors. Now, that's not always necessary uh, to, to be an art collector. Uh, it certainly helps uh, to develop 
a meaningful collection, uh, which I think is the goal of many conventional art collectors. Um, and you know, one positive outcome that I can definitely uh, predict uh, for the mainstream contemporary art world is the sort of new demographic uh, that NFTs can introduce to the base of art collectors, uh, sort of allowing them to get a foot in the door uh, and become more interested and develop a passion for art beyond just digital or NFT based art. We've seen galleries uh, start to cater uh, to this new set of collectors, as you mentioned, Jacqueline, um, with increased online sales and digital artwork offerings. You know, uh, Kona Gallery, <clears throat> which is one of these blue chip galleries that opened here in Seoul this year, they're, they're really leading the way on this. Um, they've developed their own sort of proprietary platform called Misa Art. Uh, and they have uh, released uh, exclusive artworks via that platform. And I think, you know, over the next uh, six months to one year, we're going to see more and more blue chip galleries um, enter the space and really try to compete uh, for the business of this new set of uh, sort of online collectors. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, as you just yeah. mentioned, the Massa run by the Quanic, which is a Berlin-based gallery, and the Super Blue, you know, run by the Pace Gallery, which is one of the top three galleries based in the US. They will be the two frontiers in this NFT market in conventional art world, I guess. But still, with all those concerns, there are good perspectives, I guess, uh, such as for the emerging artists, they're having more interest in this you know, NFT market with the hope that it can bring more new paradigm to their artwork. Uh, they, we can, you know, it can be a new revenue stream for that. And for buyers, it can be an emerging investment opportunity still. Uh, and maybe we can move over to our last agenda on fractional offering, which is also a very uh, hot issue you know, among the public uh, as an alternative investment. So Professor Yang, can you share us about your you know, opinion on this? Maybe from the background. Yeah, I mean, this is also a very interesting phenomenon in Korea. Uh, well, I think this phenomenon has been a very uh, noticeable since 2018 because, you know, so too and art and guide and art together and, uh, you know, Tessa, these are one, uh, you know, some of these very successful examples of this, uh, you know, the, uh, this uh, with uh, a brand new movement. The major feature of this new movement is you know, uh, it help, it really helps relieve the burden of art collectors. So art collectors do not need to store and display this uh, their collected arts over their wall in, or in their houses. They need to take care of very, you know, uh, all the temperatures or whatever uh, to protect their arts. Because these platforms help uh, to manage their, their collected arts. And besides, you know, the art collectors or the uh, investors for this, uh, artwork uh, have more possibility to uh, realize the revenue from the investment because here are two major revenue possibility from the investment in art the first one is you know sales margin and the other one is rental uh, revenues so absolutely this brand new model has helped diversify expand the revenue sources from the investment in art and recently this rental revenue uh, stays about eight percent as the annual income rate uh and uh you know a couple of months ago the cacao which is number one the art platform i'm sorry the digital platform in korea uh one of their uh subsidiary ground acts created a new uh this uh platform for this brand new art transactions named uh, clip drums uh so i mean this platform requires to use a brand new uh, token named uh, clay but all these efforts actually appeal to the uh, recent movements of MZ generations again. So uh, we talked about uh, the people's, uh, you know, the breakthrough records of this art amounting to uh, $70 million. And uh, another positive aspect for uh, this movement in Korean art is overall in the global market, the online transactions over the overall uh, sales volume takes up about 25%. But in Korean market, the online transactions takes up only 3%. So 
personally, I do believe that there are lots of margins, lots of uh, uh, rooms to uh, improve for the online transactions in the current art market. And I do believe that NFT could want a very effective trigger to boost up and uh, improve the, uh, you know, the online transactions for art in, in Korea. Thank you, Professor Yang. And I would like to hear more from, you know, Brian. Uh, Mr. Park, can you, you know, give some more opinion as a, you know, so you are taking the initiative about this um, NFT market, but I would like to hear more about what's your thoughts, you know, from the outward in this fraction offering. Because you know, previously those kind of art funds are not welcomed by the conventional outward. So fractional offerings are not welcomed in the same way. What do you think? So I have two feelings on this, the fractional offering platform. I see it as a positive sign for it becoming the evidence that people are really interested in buying art. And people think art as like an alternative, alternative investment option. But I feel worried that it is a purely interesting on buying art, like not the collecting art or studying art. Um, there are uh, thousands of galleries and art dealers, including the art dealers and others office galleries in Korea. And I can say not all of them are legally bound or like fully trustworthy. And using the platforms or dealers that we cannot fully trust on could result a detrimental of consequences consequences in the in the entire art market and i think the use uh it would be possible to find uh, buyers or in the people who are interested in buying art so the the first few rounds of the funding of this fractional offering of art could meet up the the right price but in order to sustain such ecosystem or sustain such uh the platform you need to find both good art and the good exit strategies because the selling the, the work at the right moment with the with the right price is not really an easy work and traditional galleries could help but it's kind of different uh level of the interest so it could be like a, the it would be hard for these platforms to find the right exit strategies and um I think the, also the, the, this fractional offering platform usually holds an artwork for two to three years or even less than a year. And the people in the finance world, uh, the two to three year period could be a midterm, like a short to short midterm investment period, but it is really, really a short uh, holding period for a work of art. So such different understanding in terms of investment and the, how to the, the buying and selling could result of mistrust in the market and that's what i'm kind of worried about but i see it as i as i mentioned i see it as a positive sign that people are really interested in in buying the concept of buying artists yes i agree too because in conventional art world you know normally the galleries you know um when normally uh the galleries sell the you know, quality artist artwork they recommend like three to five year non-sale agreement that comes with it. But in this, you know, new fractional offering world, because they are, the funds are from the, the financial industry, because they would like to make the profit in a short term, in you know, one or two year. And sometimes, you know, some of the people, they convince about 20% profit out of this, which is quite, which is quite a caution at this moment. Andy, do you have any opinion about this fractional offering, which is quite a you know, Korean you know, phenomenon, but is there any international view on this? Uh, unfortunately, this, again, this is not my area of, uh, of expertise. You know, as, a, as an art critic and a, and a curator, uh, I tend to be focused more on, uh, on the local art scene Fine and art. less on the, the market forces uh, on an international uh, sort of scale. Um, but I, I've enjoyed learning a lot uh, from Professor Young and Brian uh, today, uh, and I'm excited to, uh, to learn more about it in the future. Thank you, Andy. Maybe time is up. We are almost at the end of the seminar. So maybe let's have some of the wrap ups, you know, by giving the you know, advice for the day, maybe for the, the audience. Maybe let me start with Professor. 
you know, you mentioned much about the NFT and the fraction yeah. offerings. Can you give me some of the ending comments for the seminar? Yeah, I well, I want to add maybe the three more the comments throughout our discussion. The first one is current art market will grow uh, very positively. So because you know the uh, our the current GDP takes about the two percent of the global GDP, whereas our art market takes up only one percent of the global art market. So from that's just you know the uh, playing with these figures, I can tell the current market has at least you know the double the potential to double up their uh, current market size. Number two is you know the I figure that uh, uh, Mr. Bank has a very uh, different and opposite perspective opinions about this NFT. I do believe uh, I mean that is kind of a concern about the, the impact of NFT on the intermediaries in, in our transactions because NFT has potential to work as you know the Amazon for the uh, you know, publication market because NFT supports the uh, P2P or C2C I mean direct transactions between artists or uh, you know the, the, the collectors that may may decrease the influence of intermediaries and the third issue of the NFT or the fractional offering is Korean government has prepared lots of regulations to, uh, you know, manage and operate all this platform in very uh, legitimate way. Because at the moment, all these platforms such as Soto, Art and Guide, etc., did not earn any legitimate uh, permission from the Korean government. In other words, there is a risk to get involved with the shams on you know, the ownership or the copyright. So all the artists or collectors, even the Korean government, needs to uh, do new effort and activities very, you know, seriously to uh, move all this effort to very positive and very, uh, you know, to a transparent way. So these are the three comments I want to add over uh, to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yan. So to Brian, Mr. Park, uh, can you talk about, yeah, some of your wrap-up comments, can you? So I would like to point out that the it is actually a booming period for the art market and people are getting interested in in the to buying art and collecting art but i would like to say that um such like the booming cycle will go down in some time in the, in the future so people need to be worried and people need to cautious on what they're buying and what who are they dealing with a meeting uh, trustworthy dealers or the galleries is uh, crucial for the art investment as well. And also studying art is really a essence of how to invest the their their uh, their their capitals. So because like if you don't have like time to study what they're buying, they can need really need to have a dealer or the galleries who are studying for them. So so I just wanted to add a comment that the people need really need a good galleries or good dealers to consult with what they're buying. Thank you. Yes, the freeze coming and their collaboration with the Kiev will be another factor who can, you know, advocate that. Andy, you share so much, you know, opinions about the global, you know, art market and the international galleries activities in Korea today. Thank you for uh, that again. And any comments? Sure. Uh, you know, I'm I'm really uh, thrilled to see the contemporary art scene in South Korea really thriving. Um, and to me, it shows no signs of slowing down. You know, thanks to these uh, favorable business conditions, uh, the sort of established and, and, and long running uh, domestic art market, uh, as well as the the base of collectors that have been sort of growing and developing over time. Uh, it seems that Seoul is is truly on the verge of a breakout uh, as a new leader in the Asian contemporary art scene uh, and promises to present quite a strong challenge to Hong Kong uh, for market dominance in the region. Uh, of course, with the arrival of Freeze Art Fair in 2022 and continuing interest uh, from overseas galleries that are looking to open locations here in Seoul, you know, all the necessary factors uh, seem to be in place for a major boom that will see the Korean art market uh, develop into a uh, fully international market. Uh, you know, one question is whether this will lead to sustained success in the long run or whether we will see uh, sort of a bubble emerge uh, like we saw in the early 2000s in Beijing uh, when the market for contemporary Korean, Ch uh, sorry, contemporary Chinese art uh, skyrocketed and then the bottom sort of fell out a few years later 
uh, and today the Beijing art scene is sort of still recovering. You know, one thing that does hint at potential stability in the Korean art market is the presence of Freeze Art Fair, uh, which signals a strong vote of confidence from one of the international art world's most uh, influential institutions. Uh, Freeze has signed on for a minimum commitment of five years, although I'm told that they're looking uh, much farther in the future with Seoul uh, becoming a permanent fixture among its offerings. Uh, and you know, as we know, Freeze already operates fairs in London and New York and Los Angeles. And so by adding Seoul to this roster, it really elevates the city uh, to a level on par with these major international contemporary art hubs. Um, it really changes the market landscape in Korea and paves the way for potentially, you know, untold numbers of Western galleries to seriously consider Seoul as a viable place for doing business in the long term. Um, these changes don't only benefit Western galleries, though. I believe that domestic galleries also stand to gain immensely from these developments as the market becomes more globalized and tastes become more sophisticated. Uh, as the art uh, industry continues to grow uh, and collectors become more and more engaged and involved in uh, developing uh, domestic talents, uh, as well as collecting uh, major blue chip artists from overseas. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. So lastly, as an art advisor, I'd like to uh, you know, stress, uh, I'd make some recommendation. It's almost same like Andy. So like the Beijing struggling from the contemporary art boom back in 2007. Uh, even the young Korean, you know, contemporary artists are experiencing price surge in, you know, Korean auction houses like now. But unlike the gold bars, these art collection need long term, you know, stance. Um, for example, the galleries, the quality galleries, you know, who are representing the, you know, modern artist or the, even the contemporary, they have some non-sale, you know, uh, agreement, uh, like the three to five years when they sell the artwork to the collectors. So uh, these uh, activities of the gallery can give the impact on the uh, artwork price as well. And so we cannot only depend on the uh, name value or the popularity of the artist. We also need to see the name of the gallery, how the galleries are you know, doing in the market. And lastly, uh, with the globalization of the market, we also need to have a broader view, not just the, you know, uh, care about the Korean and the modern artist. We need to see what's going on in global market, as Andy mentioned. So this will be our last, you know, phrase for today's seminar. Uh, on behalf of Chuson, I would like to thank you all three other art professionals, you know, we are here for today. And thank you again for all the audiences, you know, who have been listening to us for the last one uh, hour. Thank you. And we'd like, we hope to come back with more you know, thoughts about next year freeze and everything uh, next time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for having me.